of us have been up since like three or four in the morning, and I'm not sure what time of day it is, but I would like to go to sleep very much. <laughs> but I'm also very excited to host this show. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Norbush, and this is Beyond Episode 585, IGN's weekly PlayStation show. I am joined this week by Max Scoville. I'm actually fairly well rested, still just crabby and kind of sleepy. Brian Altana. I'm a little bit of all those things, but I'm here ready to rock and roll. And Lucy O'Brien. I just want to say that you were the only person in this little group who voluntarily woke up at an obscene hour. Uh, to get Avengers tickets, uh, I'm just uh, uh, you know existential ruin. That's, That's my excuse. Yeah. That's are, the name of the we? next uh, Avengers movie. I've existential di- ruin. Been diagnosed with the night whispers, which is a Ooh. problem where the thoughts go inside the brain and you cannot sleep. Mm-hmm. Have any of you had sleep paralysis? No, because I recently realized I used to as a kid. I oh. like yeah. I I had a moment recently where and I don't think it, it counts as sleep paralysis, but I thought that there was like a like a murderer who was on my bed, like, sh- shaking my shoulders, and I was half awake, half asleep, and I was, like, calling out, like, crying out, please date me. <laughs> is that, is are that you, what you were crying Was about? that a call to action at the end, or were you I telling the murderer? No, I just realized as I was talking, I was like, stop This talking. is what you could stop. look forward to. <laughs> That's actually the new move for murderers in 2019, is the gentle shoulder shake. I'm also on Tinder. It's a little uh, pre-murder exercise, just a stretch. You, you, you can find me on Tinder and Bumble and... Anyway, coffee meets bagel. Other than that, uh, this week we're also going to talk about PlayStation and the world of games. Fuck! Uh, Hell yeah! (laughs) Sorry, I'm going to try. No, I'm glad you brought up the energy. Uh, We're going to start things off with, as we have recently, News Crunch. Crunch. (laughs) We're going to have to start paying that kid sooner or later. That that kid. I notice a new thing each time, and this time I notice the noises at the beginning and end, which sounds like somebody entering a time machine. (laughs) <laughs> I don't really know what it's all comprised of. Ronnie Barrier, our producer, mm-hmm. I'll put that together. I'll have to ask him sometime or have him on the show just to ask. Yeah. Uh, for this week's News Crunch, we have a lot to go through because a lot happened since the last episode. First thing I want to touch on was the Dreams Early Access availability has finally been confirmed for they previously had just said spring. It's going to be available in just a couple weeks on April 16th. I'm really excited. I'm really excited primarily... Um, because we've been waiting for that for so long, A. And B, it, it, I'm not going to make any levels with dreams. I'm not good at, at level building and, and creation kits. Um, but I'm so excited to see what everyone else comes up with. Yep. I Yeah, playing the dreams beta or alpha or whatever it was, the amount of ingenuity that was on display in just like three weeks of people having that game was astounding. So I can't wait to see what people who have this game for like six months are able to come up with. I think the longer you wait to play that game, the cooler it's going to be. Yeah. You know, unless you wait like 200 years or something. But, you know, like I think it's... You can't play the game at that point. Yeah. No, I mean, you look at any kind of community and sort of like, if you jumped into Minecraft now, there's like limitless stuff to check out. But if, you know, you were like an early adopter, you have to do a certain amount of legwork yourself and... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It'll be cool to see what that's like when it's actually out there. Yeah, they've wanted to really play up the fact that like creators aren't just going to play a big role in the community. Like Curators will also be a thing that people will be known for and will help shape like the storefront or essentially what you can access easily. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to see all of that creativity on display and very curious to see if we nominated a game for Game of the Year, Made in Dreams. I mm. think that will happen someday. I it totally could, based on like even just the small things people are playing. I It's insane. I love the recreation of P.T., yeah. That was, that was so, so clever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the sort of thing I want to see. Like little like spicy little horror recreations. And I feel like that's going to work out really well in that yeah. game. I kind of just want to make really bad environments. <laughs> like there was that time I was screwing around in Rec Room in VR and I just made a giant hot dog restaurant. It was just like, you know, just like stupid stuff where I'm not even like kind of half assing it. I guess just like shit posting in a 3D space. That's absolutely going to be part of Dreams. I mean, I, there's like a Legend of Zelda remake that was in the beta, yep. but it was like a really like low budget link in kind of Kakariko Village, but it wasn't really. I think obviously the first two things that will get made is the same thing people make in every everything, which is World 1-1 one, one from Super Mario and also the human penis. <laughs> Specifically oh, the, the human. Why does it yeah. have to be a human penis? Well, I think that's because the one that's the one they, they've seen the most. Okay. Fair enough. From looking down. Oh, well, uh, maybe American Vandal will live on that's true. dreams if it can yeah. live on Netflix. Or, you know, for, finish more canceled games like P.T. <laughs> That would be great if people found a new life for games that had unfortunately been canceled. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on, though, from a PlayStation game that was announced for an actual release date to a game, I'm um, jumping a little bit on our run of show, to a game that is going to have decommissioned servers. Uh, PlayStation announced that Drive Club, Drive Club VR, and Drive Club Bikes, are uh, the servers for that are going to shut down. They shut down, excuse me, on March 31st. Right. Whoa. Uh, all online features ceased 
including online multiplayer modes. People will still be able to play the single player offline modes, but however, because there's so much, uh, excuse me, it's shutting down on March 31st, 2020, not the March 31st that just happened. Again, oh. been up since four in the morning, so very tired. Um, but so essentially, they've given about a year head start for people to learn about this. You will not be able to use your season pass online, represent your club online, play online multiplayer, create your own events, or compete in leaderboards, or share other progress. So the theory here is that Car licenses are stupidly expensive, and they're not seeing returns on these games like they did when they first launched. Uh, we've seen this actually happen with racing games before, where they get decommissioned after a while because it's so expensive to main, maintain those games with licenses on them. So that kind of sucks. Um, I don't know. I'm a big champion of like an all digital future, and then I read stories like this, and I'm like, I hate this. Like I I, I played Drive Club on PSVR when it launched two years ago and the idea of that game just kind of like the servers going away in just a year is totally shitty like, yeah like, like obviously i only played a little bit of drag club so it's not my favorite game of all time or anything but like imagine if it is your favorite game ever and it's just like you won't be able to play your favorite game yeah all time. this is so always weird it's always felt like a weird second tier franchise to them yeah you know like I, I don't that's completely anecdotal obviously i don't have any statistical information to back that up but when you look at the rest of their games sort of you know, around their crown, this is not really a jewel they really care a lot about. Well, it seemed like it doesn't seem of, like it is. like a more arcadey approach to to Gran Turismo, yeah, know, or like sort of their answer to Forza, but it never really you know achieved that because those other things already exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's I don't know, it's a bummer to see it disappear like this. Um, I was I was sort of just tangentially thinking, I feel like the car licenses is a part of the reason we didn't get uh, Gran Turismo on the PlayStation Classic. Mm. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could That's have also been off. technical limitations, but like when you've got to be like, oh, you, you want the Mitsubishi? Well, too bad. <laughs> they don't make that car anymore. They need more mm -hmm. like bootleg cars yeah. fake, and fake cars. And they're still really supporting like GT Sport gets, if not weekly, like monthly big updates and everything. Right. So obviously they've kind of put all of their eggs in that cart. Um, well, it's like a Catch-22 thing because you can't just make a hyper-realistic racing game that doesn't have licensed cars in it because then it'd just be stupid. And then, I don't know people like Max and I would play it and that'd be great but we don't know what we're doing and so like this this is tough because you want to make a game that's realistic and so you have to reach out to every major manufacturer and go hey put your game or your car in this game and a lot of them are like don't crash it <laughs> like you're borrowing it for the weekend um, so we've seen a lot of hesitance of like sort of crash damage in racing games in the past and stuff too all the rules are really weird but I think that like we saw this a couple years ago with Activision pulled a bunch of their games off of the PlayStation store namely uh, Transformers and Ninja Turtles those are based on massive IPs obviously some of the biggest in the world and they weren't justified buying the license rights to keep those games online and sold on the store. So they just pulled them. And so if you have those discs, great, they run forever. But if you are wanting to buy these games for the first time digitally, you won't be able to in a year. And mm. so that's, so I think that, was, like it says a lot about the digital future and the yeah. limitations with that. So this is definitely, this is a little different than something like PT, where I believe if you've purchased the games already, you'll be able to redownload them as long as there is a, like a place for that? Yeah, like PT was even a more specific case because they took down the ability for you to like basically access it once it's deleted. Yeah. So like that was a weird one. But yeah, essentially with most cases, if a game's like less supported or anything, mm -hmm. if you own it, you still have access to it. Which means if the PlayStation 5 can't access like your digital library on PS4, then this game dies on your PS4. Yeah. That, that's a really weird one. Do you think they will, like, every digital game on PS4, do you think those will be supported on PS5? Like, that's a different backward compatibility than I really discs. hope so. Yeah. yeah. I'm just so tired of this stuff, you know? Like, just trying to, like, jumping between systems and being like, oh, never mind, sorry, this doesn't come with you. I mean, there's always the option of doing what uh, the Wii U did, which is not really like, <laughs> let's do what the Wii U did, but <laughs> that was able to boot into Wii mode, yeah. and I find that interesting. 3DS was able to play DS games. Backwards compatibility was a thing with the PS3, able to play PS2 games for a very specific SKU at launch, yeah, the, the, original, they just the have 60 a, gig model. Didn't they just have like a slim tucked in there? Basically, yeah, yeah and then they kind of stripped it out, and so there's a way to do it. I would rather... It's it's like emulation, you know. Yeah. So it does. It's not like actually kicking over into hardware mode. But yeah. I mean, this is they're coming off of the best-selling console this generation. They've sold millions of discs and millions of digital files. It would I would like to see these exist somewhere else, especially because if these things start getting decommissioned on the store, it'd be cool to sort of be like, oh, I can still play Drive Club digitally a few years from now. Yeah, and hey, I, I oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say uh, I didn't, I never actually messed with Drive Club VR. Should I should I check it out? Um, it's 
pretty, uh, it's not great looking. Like it's actually one of the, it, I think that with racing games, like you want, you want hyper realism, right? You want graphics that look really, really great. And, um, PSVR is not excellent. At that. It's not inherently. Yeah. yeah. It's not, especially when you're like, when you go playing like, you know, 4k PS4 pro games and stuff like that. And then you jump over, um, that said, it's really cool. And it's really like novel to play like a quasi realistic racing game in, in VR. Cause there's a bunch of non-realistic racing games in VR, so... I played Wipeout VR for the first time yep. this past weekend, and that was such a surreal, weird It's experience. awesome, It's right? great, but yeah. it was just so weird of like, oh, I'm in this weird, futuristic car. Yeah. <laughs> like, going around. <laughs> Have you guys um, done the Mario Kart VR in Tokyo? No. Yes. It's crazy. It's so much fun. I had so much fun. Oh, wait, no, I did not play that. I played Mario Kart Arcade in Tokyo, uh, yeah. but the VR one I did not. Yeah. I really, really wanted That to. was an experience. Does it, it work well? Or yeah. Or is it a little... It's, it, it does, yeah. Yeah. I also won my race. So hell yeah. You know, I'm especially fun. Plug of it. plug. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's so weird to me like the idea. I can get something like Drive Club where like if they're looking at what Sony uh, exclusives and first party will be supported on PS5, not wanting to keep the servers alive for this game, but yep. like, the idea that from my PS4 library I won't be able to play like a Hollow Knight or a Dead Cells next generation just because that that sort of thing doesn't carry over so or, straight or Bloodborne, if, or they, Bloodborne. if they don't yeah. like, you know, like even look at and that's the thing, right? Like with games like The Last of Us, they can, th- you know, Naughty Dog can throw money in it and go, hey, we're going to remaster this for the new generation, charge you 60 bucks again. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they do that, yes, there's a place for you to play the new version of their old game um, remade. But if From Software goes, and they will probably because they haven't even patched Bloodborne to run on, on Pro, there, there's no Pro patch specific for that game, um, then that means that, that game lives and breathes on PS4. And if there's no way to bring your digital files over to PS5, then Bloodborne is just a PS4 game forever. And then one of the best games of all times is locked on a console that will be out of date in a year or two. That yeah. sucks. <laughs> the preservation of gaming, like I, there are obviously a lot of endeavors to keep that going, but it's become more and more of like an important thing to me personally of like, mm-hmm. oh, wow, no, we need to be able to protect this stuff because it could just disappear one day. Yeah. And I think when people think about video game history and preservation, they have this idea of stuff that's like 20, 30, 40 years old and, you know, high risk scans and manuals and stuff that like, you know, Frank Cifaldi and the, you know, Video Game History Foundation are doing. And it's all awesome. But we're watching things die day to day from like three years ago yeah. and it's happening right in front of us and I think that's like such a more interesting conversation that not only are st- things from 40 years ago kind of falling into the cracks but games that we were playing when the PSVR launched which is just two years old now are already going away you know yeah. licensed games they're not you know that Turtles game was like fine but it's gone on the digital stores. Activision's Deadpool game, I think, was decommissioned. That was another that one. Was yeah. Pretty well received. Yeah, exactly. That game, that game was like surprisingly good. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's just it's for it to disappear like that just completely sucks. Yeah. It's it's a weird future we're rolling into, and I'm very curious to see how that generational gap will bridge things. Right. Uh, moving on, though, from that for a game that is not yet released but will be in a few months, uh, Borderlands 3 was finally confirmed to be real after years and months and daily teases of the number three and Gearbox. Uh, it was revealed at PAX East at a Gearbox keynote that had some technical difficulties mm-hmm. when they were revealing the game. Uh, but at that reveal, they didn't actually give too much information beyond a three-minute trailer. Uh, but they have confirmed since then in a new, basically, information drop. The game is coming out September 13th for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Uh, it will have a bunch of special editions you can buy with statues and special skins and all that stuff. I have that info. That All that info is on IGN.com, so you can mm-hmm. go read all that. But first of all, I want to ask you all, if you've seen the trailer, what you think of the reveal of Borderlands 3. I mean, like it's interesting because it really has... Uh, it feels like it's pol- polarized people a little because, uh, on the one hand, people are like, it's exactly what I want, more Borderlands. Right. And then other people are like, it's not innovating enough. <laughs> um, of course, you know, that's just the way it goes. That's the cycle. Yeah. I mean, for my, I mean, I'm not a huge Borderlands person. I think we uh, chatted about this on a, a previous episode. Um, but I, I, I mean, it, it was it was so similar to the Borderlands 2 trailer. Like, it was just very uh, beat for beat almost. Um, and I, I, I liked that. That's what I want. If uh, That's what I want from Borderlands. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it gave me exactly what I expected. There were no surprises. Uh, that's fine with me. Like, mm-hmm. Borderlands, again, not a huge like, Borderlands fan, but it was, it's always kind of been like a little bit of a meditative game for me, just something I could play and not really concentrate on and just have a fun time blowing things up. Yeah. Um, I don't really want much more from that franchise. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I, 
I'm not, I'm, I've never really been connected with this universe and I, I probably will continue not to be. I think even if this new game gets like stellar reviews, it's just not really my style. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do appreciate out of it is sort of, like I was at PAX, Gearbox wasn't really even on the show floor, uh, but their panel was packed yeah. and there was cosplay everywhere. And there was like fan art and there was, you know, like people doing like hand drawn cell shading on themselves and building and building weapons and cost and like that I appreciate. I think I love I love the people that latch on to like its sort of unique aesthetic and they go with it. Um, it's so funny that that universe also almost didn't have that aesthetic. Right. That mm. it, and it was right. Like a whole, yeah. To me, it's like the most defining thing about it, yeah. you know? And it's also, it's a thing that a lot of people have done since, but it's still like, that's still kind of theirs. It's their thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so. yeah, it's interesting to me. I've played Borderlands 1 and 2 all the way through by myself. I've never really played them in co-op. Tales from the Borderlands is actually my favorite thing from that universe because mm -hmm. I think like, Whereas I didn't care for some of the writing of the last games and the story was whatever to me, that game just nailed, like, made me give a shit about the world, the characters, these new people that were thrown into it. And I was like, oh, I want to see that continue. Yeah. So it was nice, like, the trailer did tease, like, that part of the story will not be forgotten. So that, mm -hmm. for me as a fan, is exciting. But yeah, I'm. it's a weird thing where it's been, like, six years since Borderlands 2 or so, or maybe even seven or eight, and it's... I want it to be more of the same, but I also, there have been so many advancements in shooters and looter shooters and all that sort of stuff that like they, there need to be some modern advancement. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like a lot of Borderlands fans have, are, are just happy that it's more of the same, you know, yeah. that it's, it's familiar. Uh, I was sort of, I don't know, from a distance sort of like, I don't, I don't really care one way or the other. I've tried to get into Borderlands. It's never really grabbed me. Um, but I know a ton of people who really love it and adore it and I want them to be happy. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I think it's it is weird when you have a game where there's the first iteration and it's like oh wow this is really good and then there's the second one that blows it out of the water and then there's a long wait for the third installment and there's also a lot of heightened expect like th like three goals are always tricky you know um, you know you look at Return of the Jedi you look at the Dark Knight Rises and then you look at other stuff like um, I don't know <laughs> you know GTA three Duke Nukem three D <laughs> Fallout three like the third sort of installment has this expectation to either you know, kind of go big or go home. Mm -hmm. And this sort of seems like almost like it's not, you know, a huge, you know, exponential improvement. It's kind of like staying on track and it's like, well, what took you so long? It's like, well, you made Battleborn. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And um, I mean, aliens, colonial Marines. And like, there's been a couple of yeah. things that like sort of came out of the studio that doesn't exactly scream confidence from me. Um, that said, like, We'll we'll take a wait and see approach. I don't want to like you know chastise them on their next game based on their previous decisions. Well, they've but they, also been dabbling in publishing. That's the yeah, other thing yeah. is that they haven't just been working on new stuff internally. You know, and it's easy to sort of poke fun and be like, oh, you put Duke Nukem in Bulletstorm. Is that what took so long? And it's like, well, they also what is that? They release like Homeworld. Mm -hmm. like Homeworld. They just, they're like handling We Happy Few. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. They're all over the place in terms of trying to be a larger company. Yeah, there are medieval the times. <laughs> Having dinner yeah. and tournaments. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's tricky to get a handle on, um, you know, I, I guess trying to iterate on something that's already, you know, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. But what's th what's th new and exciting? Yeah. One thing I, I do hope they uh, they continue getting right uh, is the, the comedy. I think like Borderlands is one of the very few like comedic franchises yep. in the video game space. Uh, and like Tales from the Borderlands did it so well. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see because that was obviously like the Telltale team writing exactly. based on the original and uh, I believe Anthony Newman, uh, if I'm getting his name correct, wrote the first game, whereas... Mikey it, Newman? Mikey Newman, excuse me, and then Anthony Birch wrote the right. second one. Right. Sorry, I portmanteaued them. Uh, and both of them are not the writers for this game, so right. I'd be curious to see like how, if it just continues to be like generations of adapting a voice, but if well, it yeah, the world. I mean, I think we, like, Jonathan, you and I were having a conversation about this, like, I just hope that it's not aping the comedy that yeah. was, that was very organic and um, well, yeah, organic in the first couple of games. Yeah. I just hope that it is actually genuinely funny and it's in its own way. Yeah, a lot of the comedy in like Tales comes from the characters in the situations, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of Borderlands One and then some of Two was like more referential or like we made a boner joke. A boner joke is funny because it is a boner joke. Mm -hmm. Laugh at the boner joke, please. Yeah, uh, it, I totally agree. Um, it's it is sort of refreshing to have. Especially in 2019, a like a, a shooter that doesn't take itself too seriously, because obviously that has been the running theme for first person shooters, continues to be. That hasn't really changed. I mean, Apex Legends has some goofiness, but it's also not really like story driven. Their new know? character, Octane, just looks straight out of Borderlands. Oh, totally. Like it's yeah. totally shot for shot remake. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what does Borderlands do? Like, what? I mean, obviously, comedy 
comedy shifts with with time. It, you know, it evolves in the same way that video game mechanics do too. And this is the first Borderlands game on current hardware, which is already sort of approaching its twilight years. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be curious to see what they do with the you know upgraded technology and what that looks like. But also, how does the comedy? How does it age? Like mm-hmm. you've got characters who have like clearly visibly grown up since you know previous iterations of the game, uh, and you know if they've got new people working on it, it's like what, how, like basically. If it's more Borderlands, that's good on like sort of a fundamental like mechanical level. But like, what are they? What, you know, what's the new? What's the new special sauce? Right. What what's the point of making there? a yeah. sequel and not just maybe releasing Borderlands two with more content? Like, yeah. yeah. But how do you, how do you make this one stand out? Yeah, exactly. And I think with any with any gap this big between sequels, uh, you run the questions of like who is actually making this? Who still worked on the last one? Yeah. And this happens with everything, right? I mean, even the, even the Last of Us two has lost. Naughty Dog, very key people in the development of those of the original game aren't really there anymore. Yeah. And so studios change, they grow, they're sort of like baseball teams or the mm-hmm. IGN staff. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you, things ebb and flow and, you know, you wonder who's there. Yeah, so. and you get that interesting thing, though, of like people who are now working on it were fans of it when it first yeah. came out and how that influences. Which them. is we cool. See, we see that in movies all the time. So, yeah, it'll be curious to see. Borderlands comes out September 13th. So, obviously, we'll probably be seeing quite a bit of it in the months to come. Yep. Uh, also wanted to cover the fact that PlayStation Plus has two free games this month that we did not cover last week because, of course, they announced it the day after we recorded. Of course. Uh, just to mention quickly, it's Conan Exiles. As well as the surge. Oh, I like the surge. You played the surge. Yeah, I, I was wondering if any of you. I hadn't played either. I played the surge. I missed cool. it a little bit. Yeah, I'm kind of curious to see what it's like after now that I've I've figured out Bloodborne. You know, mm-hmm. that yeah, I got in the hang of that because I remember like dicking around in, in the surge and being like, I'll try this, and then being like, I'm scared. I'm going home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Conan Exiles is phenomenal on on PC. You can adjust your genital sizes. That's what that game is known. You can't. That is that is the only thing I know about that game. Yeah, I was legitimately the human penis. I was outraged (laughs) that you couldn't just have big swinging dongs on PS4 because it's a puritanical console for children. Yeah, it's a, it's a curious month. I don't know. Obviously, like Conan, they've kept supporting that game since it came out like two years ago or something. So it's probably a very different game than when it was first revealed for having a dong slider. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I don't really know much of what that game's impact has it, been. If you're like a FromSoft fan in any capacity, you should check out The Surge. Yeah. Um, especially for free on PlayStation Plus because it's, it's got a, enough going on there that it's that it's fun. Um, it's got some sort of mechy Fallout environments but it's also it does a lot on its own that that feels fun and it's very brightly colored too which is cool like it's not a really cheerful junkyard yeah which is cool i appreciate the aesthetic in this game uh moving on from that obviously you can download those through the month of april and we'll probably find out the next two games after we record an episode three weeks from now uh moving on sony is going to stop retailers from selling ps4 download codes uh, so basically, if you want to buy something on the PSN, you'll have to buy it directly from the PSN versus, say, buying on Amazon or GameStop or something like that. Right. Uh, I just for some reason thought that that would have stopped a long time ago. A long time ago. Um, it seems shady as hell. Do you just buy, like, a piece of paper with a code on it? Yeah. Or what, like, basically, yeah. You buy, yeah. like, a card. Yeah. yeah, like you would buy, like you can buy Nintendo eShop points from, like, right. Target, and they're just next to Applebee's and so Oh, wait, cards. like, so, like... Basically, like the gift card thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. but like for specific things. For specific games, and so yeah. this actually ties into the conversation we were having earlier about Drive Club. Um, I don't have it on hand, but there's a list of games that are basically decommissioned from the store or will be that you can still buy digital codes of to have on your PS4. And currently, this is the only way to get those games digitally. Um, and again, Here. I don't have the list offhand. Yeah, uh, I'll find it That's, and tweet it out. But. That whole like concept seems so strange to me to buy, to buy a code and like to go to a brick and mortar store, a Rick and Morty store, and and purchase a piece of paper with a code on it that you then type into the internet. Like it just, it's just it's such a weird um like, it's straddling the line between the past and the present. So like it, it yeah, like it's a physical thing mm-hmm. that gives you a digital product. Yes, and it does. It, it it's yeah. like it, it, well, again. Well, it's like what it is what a, it reality is a, are we living in? It is a vestigial transaction. No, I mean you're living in a reality where people are utilizing a different form of currency than the one that we use when we buy shit online, which is GameStop fun bucks. So if you want to buy a, a game digitally, say like you trade in a bunch of physical stuff, you have a bunch of old Wii U games or something like that, you trade them in, uh, and then you want to buy a video game, and then you go like, oh, well, what can I get? And they have this game digitally or this game physically. Uh, you buy a points card, and you bring it home, and you do that. 
Um, and so that's all people who are, are people who don't have credit cards, who, but, but but do have cash, and, and also who that. don't want to put their credit cards on the PSN. Obviously, we've seen hacks and everything. That too. Like, it, it's yeah. cre- I think a lot of people probably who buy those may not want their debt out there. Yeah. Like that. And if I guess the, GameStop. the the weird leap is I totally understand the idea of buying like uh, you know PSN bucks cards or buying like. I guess the idea of it being a specific game is what really just kind of like I have a hard time wrapping my head around because it's like why wouldn't you just buy the currency and then redeem that? Because because the fact that there are codes out there for specific games is kind of because like the PlayStation Store logo carries no weight or nostalgia or connection to any mm. anything, whereas this gives you an actual retail presence in a store. So you can walk into a store and you can be like, oh, there's a there's a box here or there's a, a slip um, that says Borderlands 3 mm-hmm. and you can buy it digitally. All this is really doing for fans of video games is reducing the amount of options they have to purchase games. And so for us, it sucks. Sony, Again, yeah. 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 Sony clearly wants it to bring it all back to the PSN. Like they yeah. want you to buy directly from them. They obviously get the most cut of it. Yes. Yeah. There are so many more benefits to them for you to buy through the PSN than to even like pre-order a digital game through games. But, I, but even from like a, st- a store perspective, um, it it like it doesn't make much sense. I worked at um, EB Games for years mm-hmm. and a lot of the, a lot of the people that shopped at EB Games um, were like parents and you know guardians and stuff like that shopping for their kids. And it would have been a very hard sell to be like, oh no 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 you don't want the disc. You want this strange card right it's the same thing mm-hmm. and it's like that that's that's not that that's a hard sell well i had this i had this this christmas uh that made, and it made me feel like a piece of shit uncle because i've got two nephews who are both super into gaming and i've got like a niece who's into toys because she's like a, a kid still uh and i was like for the boys i want to get them some you know i'm gonna get them some Fortnite bucks or some pokemon go money or whatever and i like i dicked around and i was like where do you where do you, how do you buy like a gift card for V Bucks? And I think you have to do it through like the Epic Game Store. And I've, I like futzed around for a minute, and then eventually just said fuck it, and I gave my uncle forty bucks and was yeah. like, ask your like I was like ask your dad for fucking dance moves, or gun, <laughs> right? Hell, that gun. You know, and it was, it, but it, it felt bad because I was just like, it felt like sleazy to be like, you just go ask your dad. I, I paid it off, and then being yeah. like. Oh, to my niece being like, here's a present. I wrapped it up. Like, I wanted to give them like a card. Yeah, and be like, the yeah. So the hook here is not that GameStop or EB Games makes money off of these games digitally or that they make money off of physical games, really. The hook is that they get you into the store. And while you're in the store, you make a tangible purchase that connects to something else that ultimately feeds some money. That's why they partner with ThinkGeek. So you can go into a store to be like, I'm going to get Borderlands 2 physically or digitally. And while you're there, like, shit, they make Borderlands socks? Or they have Funko Pops, or they have these like Star Wars Black Series action figures. I'm gonna get those. It's the same way. It's just like it's like buying magazines or a candy bar on the way out of a grocery store. And those businesses are dying now because less people are going into stores for things like that to begin with. So that sort of like, you know, it's it's kind of like when when Sears and Macy's goes away in the mall. So does the Wetzel's Pretzels and the weird Shiatsu massage stand, <laughs> like the the Guppies and Whales situation. And so this is to me one more sign of the times that we are like maybe seven to 10 years from GameStop just being like a video game version of TJ Maxx where it just looks like this, like dystopian wasteland. I mean, it's just like, depends on the topic and just buy it. Yeah. Really struggling this year. Yeah, Yeah. they are. And they're, I read a thing about how they're, they're, they're trying to reboot their stores to be more experiential and be places where you can go and play more games. Because right now, like to actually go to GameStop and play video games is not really a big part of it, which is weird because if it's like if I go to like Chef Central or something to buy like a, you know, up frying pan, there's like six stations where I can eat food. <laughs> you know, there's all these different things where people are trying things out and stuff like that. But Even, that's what stores retail, like brick and mortar stores need to do. That's what they need I mean, to that's do. What, yeah. That's what good like game stores are doing. You go in the back and you play Warhammer with your friends. Or yeah. yeah. And, 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 yeah. And, and kind of crazily, that's how they began. That's what they were when I was growing up. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you'd go in there and you play games and it was like this experience, you know, and that's what like record stores have to do to survive as well. Like it, it, you need to give people and experience now otherwise they're just going to get it online exactly and the the big issue here too is that most 
real estate like footprints for game stops are incredibly tiny like they're actually brick and mortar presence is is Super is a shoebox compared yeah. to like a big you know uh department store or even a record store for the most part i mean no, they're like a, the size of little caesars yeah exactly they're very very small stores so the idea of like packing a bunch of people in there to play new games and like watch exclusive trailers and stuff like that i mean i think the average person couldn't imagine walking into a place like that to watch like the new Borderlands trailer, you know? And so it's all connected. And I think ultimately, I don't, you know, I've, I've never really been the biggest fan of GameStop. I think it's an awesome retail job for people. Like I've worked shitty retail jobs and I wish I had worked at a GameStop instead of like, I don't know, Staples selling <laughs> office supplies. But ultimately all of these decisions are funneling into you, the, the consumer only having one option to buy a video game and that's directly from the manufacturer who at any given moment can yank that rug out. And so... It sucks to see that kind of stuff go away. So it's also like video games lose their their, their presence on the street in terms of foot traffic, um, and all that bums me out. But yeah, it's like blockbuster yeah. going away. You know yeah. that still bums me out. And like, me I'm too. Like, I'm like sad that I can't just go into a store at like a blockbuster and just peruse the, the aisles and make a decision after spending an hour there. After looking at all these boxes that may or may not have art on them. Yeah, I was I was titles. like pushing my daughter's stroller around the other day in my neighborhood, and I looked over and on the wall on a building outside it was like a brick wall, and there was this like very crudely painted over yellow and blue mail slot that said like. Oh, like it was like blockbuster video drop off. And I was like, oh, that's right. We used to have to do that. Like there was a flap you opened up when you didn't want to face the guy inside because you knew you owed money. And you were like, here's the film I watched. But I kept for too long and I owe you seven dollars. And when I come back in here, I'm going to get punished for it. But until then, this is like this faceless transaction. Yeah. I'm sorry it took me four days to watch <laughs> Chain Reaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the function of GameStops has obviously changed quite a bit. And right. I'm curious to see if they can find any success in being like communal meeting places of any kind, uh, like board game stores can be. And like nerdy toy stores at the same yeah. time, right? Yeah, like, totally. But yeah. again, like my dad, my dad owns a record store and he's his business has kind of survived through having like in stores. Stuff like that, right? Like, yeah. like making it very much like this is a place where you can actually go and see a gig as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's like that's a cool thing about like midnight launches and stuff like yeah. that, right? Like that's it's kind of the closest to that. Yeah, yeah. there's the closest we have to that. Mm. But. I, I mean, we've seen this sort of like the death of brick and mortar stuff as uh, you know in in the under the crushing wheels of the internet. But I feel like as the internet becomes an increasingly horrible place to just hang out, we're probably going to be like, I got to get out of here. I got to go and <laughs> I got to go, go and I, I got to go to GameStop with to. a warm body. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've said this in like in a billion different shows at this point, but the thing that I miss that gets lost on the internet is the internet curates things in differently than a store does. Um, and walking into a Blockbuster or a record store presents you with options that you wouldn't know to search for on, on Amazon or YouTube yourself. And so when I, you have to specifically be shown something or uh, type it in yourself, which means you become your own curator. And you lose a lot of the shit that I had growing up, which is like flipping through the channels and you're like, what's Texas Chainsaw Massacre? And you just watch it and you're like, oh my God. Like you have to go out of your way to rent that movie now. And why would you? It sounds terrifying. Now you can just flip through a thousand screenshots that yeah. Netflix feeds you to exactly. maybe see yep. something you might want. Yep. Yeah. We, it, the ecosystem of discovery has- Can we talk changed. about video games again? Yeah, let's go back to video games. Uh, moving on very quickly. Wolfenstein Youngblood has a release date. Uh, it's coming out July 26th for PS4, or Xbox One, PC, and Switch. That looks so great. I loved the trailer that Me they showed with the release date. I mostly want to talk about that. I tweeted it, but like it looked like Broad City mm -hmm. meets Wolfenstein, and I'm like real into the two sisters, like that dynamic. I'm really excited to see how they act throughout the game. Yeah. Um, I didn't end up actually playing Wolfenstein 2, but so I know good. it's beloved. I, I kind of want to get to that beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also just wanted to mention that Darkborn, we were able to exclusively reveal this game. It's currently only announced for PC, but consoles are under consideration. It's this very cool looking game uh, made by the Outsiders. Uh, it's this weird sort of thing where you're playing like this little creature, a monster, and it's essentially like if you were the monster in like a Skyrim world, but you were trying to fight the Dovahkiin and all of them. Yeah, they specifically mentioned like Shadow of Mordor and like how you kill so many things in that game. But like a lot of those things, maybe they don't think they're the bad guys. And what it's what it's like to grow up as one of those like ugly orc monsters as a child, as a baby, as a child, and basically just tear apart humans. And like it's it's a bloody, visceral, 
violent pitch, and I'm super into it. That sounds great. Yeah, it's yeah, really too. cool. It doesn't have a release date right now. Uh, again, consoles aren't announced for it, but hopefully if you are interested in it, definitely check it out. We have like 15, 16 minutes of gameplay on the website that you can take a look at. Uh, mm-hmm. It looks really cool. Moving on from that, though, that is the end of our News Crunch segment. I want to talk about the fact that Brian, Max, and I got to see a bunch of PSVR games. Sorry, Lucy, that you did not get to come to that one. It's fine. I will uh, I will just sit here and ask you questions about them. That works. Uh, yes, yeah, so we got to see a bunch of basically the like next phase of PSVR games coming out. Uh, we saw Marvel's Iron Man, Blood and Truth, Concrete Genie's VR mode, Nomad Sky VR, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's was there as well. We saw basically a host of different games coming up. And so I wanted to hear from you guys. What was like some of the most impressive stuff to you? What like really stuck with you after the event? Yeah, I think it was like, um, what, two or three days after the State of Play PlayStation Direct thing yeah. came out, which I think a lot of people, we talked about it, were sort of lukewarm about it. Um, to immediately get hands-on with a bunch of those things really helped a lot and really made me understand their vision for that, for that presentation a little bit better. Um, I played... Blood and Truth? Yes. Yes. So I, those are the two words. I, I keep getting confu- confused with like Blood and Sweat or Sweat right. and Tears or 50 Cent Blood in the Sand. Um, that one. It's easy to mix those Pain up. Pain and Gain. Um, Pain and Gain, yeah. which is uh, basically like the full or what plans to be the full sort of pitch from the guys that did London Heist, which is part of the VR Worlds package that launched with PSVR. Um, that was like the first yeah. PSVR game where it clicked for me. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. It was, was it really you, special. I remember very distinctly, this was at GDC. This mm-hmm. was like almost exactly three years ago, I think. Three or four. Oh, God, it must have been five years ago, actually. How long is it? When did, 2016, it's I think. It's been it a while. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, it's been a minute. I don't, yeah. I don't think I was even at IGN, but I remember like playing the, the London Heist thing, and I reflexively picked up a flashlight and threw it. And then realized about a second and a half later that the game totally played along. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I had that I had that with this one too. This demo starts with you and it's it's very, you know, um, it's a very sort of like schlocky, just over the top, very thick like British heist game. <laughs> this is a very British game. Yeah. Very, they, it's like Guy Ritchie esque. Yeah. Well they totally. said that London Heist was Guy Ritchie and this oh, okay. is more like John Wick die hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, like I definitely right. got some Casino Royale vibes from it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh and it's uh, essentially like a just a large string of really fun action movie vignettes that you play through that are all interconnected with one story. But it's also like it it never feels like it takes itself way too seriously. It's it's super fun. It feels like the sort of maturation of 90s arcade games um, and, and light gun games and stuff like that, but with a lot more kind of accessibility and maneuverability. Uh, you can strafe in this game. You can aim. You can do all sorts of stuff. Um, to reload your gun, you can actually reach down, grab a clip, and pop it into your gun. And you do that with two move controllers, hmm. which I'm sure in real life looks very stupid because it's just like two clown noses bonking against each other. <laughs> but uh, in the game, it's really fun. The only thing that kind of broke me was I was dual wielding at one point, and I had like a I had like a small assault rifle in one hand, or like a, it was like a mini mini gun or whatever the fuck. And in the other hand, I have a handgun, and I was just like in a car car chase, and I was like, "How do I reload?" And I didn't know how to put it down. <laughs> how do but I you hold had a, all these limes? Yeah, but you had a uh, basically you can holster your handgun on your right side by motioning towards your hip and putting it there. And then your assault rifle you put over your shoulder. So you have, you sort of have to do this sort of like, you know, rub your stomach, scratch your head, chew gum and walk and talk at the same time type of thing. And also shoot a gun. And shoot a gun, which gets a little confusing, especially when things get really high paced and frenetic and you're like, I have to shoot machine guns and helicopters and I'm out of bullets. Um, But there's a lot of really fun little things to do in this game that, uh, again, because of the power of VR, I think there's like, are a lot more interesting. Like there's a lock picking mini game. And so to do that, you just like you do in Splinter Cell, you put two of those tweezers that every good crook carries with him everywhere in every video game. And you start twisting them and pinching the buttons at the same time. We'll, we'll slow down. Yeah. You have this whole kit. Yeah. It's not just for lock picking, it's for like bomb defusal and like wire cutting. Yeah. And you oh, pull, you awesome. basically it it uh sort of like floats against the wall and you based on different scenarios, access different parts of it. And so you're allowed to reach in and grab like the tweezers or the pliers or like the, you know, like l- little like wires and nodes it, and stuff like that. It feels like a little kid's like doctor kit. Yeah. You know? Like there's something very toyetic about it where you're like, you put this thing up and you're like, oh, what am I going to use for this? Mm-hmm. What's the what's the tool set? Yeah. And so I love all that. There's a lot of little things like that. And, and Max, you mentioned like throwing the flashlight. The demo starts with me being sort of like, 
uh, I don't know, uh, just really talked down to by this like large, powerful man. And while he's talking to me, he's giving this very stern talking. I picked up the clipboard on the table. And I'm just kind of looking at it and just like instinctively flicked it across the room like I'm skipping a rock against the river. And it just worked. And he just like kind of like glanced at me and just kept looking. And I was like, I don't think I was supposed to do that. That's what I mean. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really cool. Like you go through basically warehouses where shooting guys down. You blow open a door with C4. You open up locks. Uh, you do these high speed chases over rooftops. And then it ended in a uh, in a car where I was sitting. And this is where I grew up in America. And I'm not used to sitting on the wrong or what I deem the wrong side of the car. <laughs> so I was like looking in front of me. And I drive in San Francisco all the time. And there was no steering wheel. And I'm like, I can't. Oh, he has a steering wheel. I'm in like a funny car. And so I looked over. And the I'm, comedy car. Yeah, the comedy car. From England. It's one of these metric cars. And it made me realize I really want like a, but a PSVR buddy cop game. Like I want Tommy Boy VR where we're like, there's two of us in a car together and we're on a road trip and I can like, I can play with the radio and I can open up the glove compartment and reach over and honk the horn and do all sorts of silly nonsense. So uh, I feel like if uh, the night school guys ever did VR, like the actual yeah. death, that would be like a perfect thing. Oh man, that'd, that'd be, be so like great. Uh, so I don't know how long the full version of the game is going to be. I feel like I was talking about this with Max. Like I feel like two hours, three hours would be a really good sweet spot because it would give me and like friends a chance to play through a bunch of times. Like you could have people over and be like, "Oh, well, like play the first half of this game" or something like that. Um, and it never really felt boring. It always felt like there was enough going on. Uh, and so I think if like they scored you based on your skill and hit some unlockables and stuff like that, uh, this would be a really fun one to like sort of like comfort food your way through a couple times a year. It yeah. felt like, I mean, in the same way that um, Astrobot Robot Rescue was sort of the logical full scale progression of uh, what is it, the Astrobot Playroom, whatever. Yeah, the yeah. Playroom VR. The thing that was on that same demo disc. Yeah. Uh, this is that with the London heist, and I'm really excited to see how how deep it goes. Um, yeah, that comes out May 28th. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm like I'm pretty excited. About I this. yeah, I can't wait to play that full thing. Um, uh, Max, what else did you see? Uh, I got a chance to check out uh, what is it? Trover Trover saves the universe. Yes, yeah. which is from uh, Squanch Games, formerly Squanch Tendo, which is Justin Roiland of Rick and Morty fame's uh, studio. Um, Justin Roiland clearly is like very invested in VR. Uh, he has been sort of he's had his fingers in all sorts of it. He did um, Accounting Plus, which is to date I think the funniest video game I've ever played, which is also a PSVR game. Uh, he was sort of loosely involved with um, Rick and Morty, or well, I mean you know, closely involved Rick and Morty Virtual Reality, which was uh, basically a sort of Rick and Morty themed job simulator, which makes sense because it was made by Alchemy Labs. Uh, this is the first game that he's been involved with it feels like it's legitimately kind of like trying some new stuff um whereas the previous games have sort of been like a first person thing and then you know the controllers are your hands or whatever and it's it's very like kind of straightforward and intuitive in that sense in this time around you play as uh, a person who's sort of confined to a chair it's like the society of people who just sit in chairs and watch like tv all day uh and then you're you're your dogs get stolen by this giant chicken that shoves them in its eye sockets it's really fucking weird, and it's it's just Justin Roiland. And you're hell. controlling like, so Trover, right? You could, well, no. So that's or, the thing is you okay. control the person. I hate I hate trying to describe this, and I think that part <laughs> of the why com- I'm asking part of the comedy is making people try to explain this. Um, you play as this person who's sitting in the chair, so you're wearing the VR headset. It shouldn't feel like too much of an out of body experience because you look down and you see hands holding a PlayStation controller and a lap and like the arms of a chair and you can rotate the chair here and there. You can interact with stuff that's nearby you by I think looking at it and pressing R1. But then you meet this guy named Trover who takes these little things called power babies that he shoves in his eye sockets and then you're able to control him. And he just controls like a like a third person 3D platformer character. Like you make him run around and you're kind of locked in one location um, and if you make him run to like a different node, you can basically teleport between spots. So it's incre- it, it basically just takes the it, it takes the whole idea of like Luda narrative dissonance and it just rubs it no- rubs its nose in it. Like it's completely acknowledging the fact that everything you're doing that is video gamey is part of the story and it's complete gibberish and nonsense. Um, at one point, like I interacted with like a, an NPC, it was this old man came out and was like, "Ah, oh, you can't go past here." And it was this is again just very early sort of tutorial phase stuff, and I'm curious to see how deep the game gets. Um, but this this character comes out and he goes, you know, just starts yelling at me in the in that very Royland sort of nonsensical space alien sort of way, and was asking me like yes or no questions, and I was like nodding with the headset, and at the same time I've got I'm making Trover sort of run around in the background, and Trover's like, uh, I think he's like. 
you know, I could probably fight this guy if you wanted or something to that effect. And he just pulls out a lightsaber. And so to proceed, I just basically beat the crap out of this NPC who was sort of getting in my way. Uh, and then he's like, wow, you could probably kill him if you kept hitting him like this. And I keep hitting him. I like, wow, wow, you were really doing it. You're really going for it. This guy's dead. We got to get the fuck out of here. And it's, uh, yeah, it's completely, you know, foul mouthed and weird and like that that wonderful sort of Rick and Morty fine line of like sort of just simultaneously like wholesome and offensive like gross but sort of like harmless Endearing. yeah mm-hmm. yeah in a weird um, way. and it's yeah and it's got obviously like a whole kind of comedic story to it and there's there was some combat and it's but it's weird because it is both a first person and a third person game that's very cool yeah. I, I mean I like any video game that uh, acknowledges the fact that it's a video game and breaks mm-hmm. that fourth wall and like you know the Stanley Parable kind of thing where it's just mm-hmm. like all right we are going to play with tropes and like mix things up and we're c- completely acknowledging that that's what we're doing yeah I love that I think it's so fun yeah I it looked so funny I didn't get to play it myself but yeah I, everything I've seen of it I think we have like six minutes of gameplay on the site like a, a very hard R trailer of it, it looks bonkers it um, looks great. accounting accounting and accounting plus are that was a collaboration between William Pugh of Stanley Comparable fame and Justin Roiland. And my understanding is I think I spoke to them at like PSX last year or the year before or whatever. And they just I think just got really drunk in a hotel room together and just tried to sort of game jam. And the result is like completely manic and insane and wonderfully sort of off the cuff. This feels considerably more intentional, but still very weird and very silly. Interesting. I'm so. super looking forward to that. That comes out May 31st as well. So May and April are pretty packed. Uh, also at the event, before I get to Iron Man, I wanted to shout out Falcon Age, which comes out April 9th. Uh, we had Eka on the show from Out of Loop Games mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. Uh, I really played for a few minutes. Maxie and I played. I don't know mm-hmm. if you got to play Brian. Um, but basically, I fell in love immediately in the game when like you have your Falcon flying around and it got hurt and you had to call it back to help it. And you have to do that by pulling essentially like the robot shoot needles kind of at it. And you have to pull them out of the bird as it's like calling like in pain and it's just like oh as a pet owner it's the most heartbreaking thing of like, oh, oh god instantly wow. i was like oh i love this falcon and i want to protect it no matter what yeah um, but it also did a really cool like comfort thing which echo talked about on the show basically you can do the teleport sort of movement in vr but you can as you're picking the point to teleport to you can angle the move controller to change the way your character is facing so if you want to teleport to like a space 10 feet in front of you but be facing to the right as you land you can just instantly do that without having to like shift your character over or anything. oh that's i feel like a bunch of people are going to take that uh, yeah that's huge i think he said that no man's sky also does that yeah. oh interesting i feel like that is the equivalent of vr strafing yeah 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 and it's, it's phenomenal i'm i'm so excited for falcon age i feel like this whole roundup of games was like this is this felt like sort of and i've, I've said this a bunch of times but this felt like the leap from PSVR stuff being sort of weird novelty gimmicky stuff to like here are the full blown games right. that's been yeah. in the oven long enough. Yeah, and yeah. one of the ones that like so surprised me was Iron Man VR, which uh, comes from Camouflage, which is behind Republic, a very different game. Uh, before this, but they have a lot of heavy hitters at the studio, including Ryan Payton, who mm-hmm. is at three four three. Yeah, he's got a weird, like, incredible pedigree of like Halo and Metal Gear. Yes, yeah, and so I got to play like twenty or so minutes of Iron Man VR, which was way more than I expected, and answered a lot of questions I had after the reveal trailer, and made me like so much more excited for the game than I thought I would be. I've read your, I've read your hands on impressions, um, but I'm I'm just so curious. Does it nail the feeling of flight? Yeah. So it's, it's that weird thing of like initially I say it in the preview, but like if you play Iron Man VR for like five minutes, I think you will hate the game because it takes a little while to get used to it. Mm. You do need an adjustment period, but it's worth taking that little bit of struggle um, because it's really smart about mirroring the way Iron Man flies in the movies with essentially his hands and then his feet being the thrusters. And as you move those, you affect the speed and the flight. So basically, if you want to hover in place, you can use your two hands, the move controllers, and hold them so that they are flat and basically horizontal to the ground. And you can just keep like tapping to lightly keep yourself in place, or you can hold them down to like thrust up. You can then like shoot your hands all the way up to shoot yourself down. You can keep one hand like hovering and then shoot with your other hand. Oh my like, God, that's you so basically, cool. You basically, like you feel so much like you're mirroring the moves of Iron Man in the movie. And right. I mentioned it in the preview, but... <laughs> but you don't look it in No, you, life. <laughs> you don't look it. You look like an idiot. Um, <laughs> no, you look like an air traffic controller. Right? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you, you are, your arms are like fully extended. Like right. this is not a game where you're going to play like really... You could play pretty close, but it is so much more intuitive to move your arms. Like by the end of it, if I needed to shoot up into the air, I was doing the dumb like hands to my side, chest out, like looking up, looking up. as Iron Man. Like, awesome. I was, there's this moment... Um, 
Batman Arkham VR was the first thing that really hit me for VR. And when you put the cowl on and then it's like, oh, I'm Batman now. Mm -hmm. Like in this game that happens where like you are in the middle of, they shown it in the trailer, but essentially there's your plane gets hacked and an explosion happens. You get tossed out. And then, so the Iron Man armor starts coming on and like that, uh, that moment in the game isn't super great where like it's, it's very sort of like standard, like the pieces of armor are slowly coming towards you in VR. And so you just kind of have to wait there for a minute. Right. But then when the, uh, when the mask comes over you, the world goes dark for a minute. And then you just hear that really familiar, like boot up noise and the UI starts popping up and then the sky appears in front of you and you can move. And it has that slight delay that it has in the movies where like the UI is kind of moving a little slower in the world. And it's just like, Oh, I'm I'm flying like I'm Tony Stark in the movie. That is this brilliant. Is, I'm so seeing cool. it. Like, yeah. like I'm just getting chills just from you describing it. It yeah. was such a surreal feeling. Yeah. And yeah. so I think like this didn't really demo well in the PlayStation State of Play. No, the it's trailer. Like, I, I mean, a lot of VR games don't. No. Yeah. That, I mean, that's one of the biggest issues with with VR, and that I think GameStop will fix when they let people play video <laughs> games in their store. Yeah. No, I mean, like you have to kind of go hands on with some of this stuff or talk to somebody that did. I think just seeing a trailer doesn't really sell you on but it. But I remember yeah. that was one of Sony's biggest sort of hurdles right before um, they were going to release VR. I remember chatting to that Sony guide, like the head of Sony in Australia, and he was just like, the problem is you need to experience it. Yep. It's, yeah. it's so impossible to convey what the feeling is like through a trailer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, like, the, the Iron Man trailer made it look like an on-rail shooter. Yeah. It some looked of, some yeah. really boring. Some of the best like PSVR games look like PS2 games mm-hmm. when you look at them two-dimensional. Yeah. Uh, Iron Man, immediately when I saw it, I was like, oh... Like, I guess it's going to be another tie-in to Endgame, sort of like they did with Spider-Man Homecoming. There was that, like, very whatever promotional thing. Yeah. yeah. And then, that was my gut reaction, yeah. too, was and like, this was, is, this is a, like, a, a quick throwaway, like, PSVR freebie. Yeah. But it's been development it's, for years. And it's not, It's yeah. fully <laughs> featured. The, like, flight mechanics are so ingenious and so fully functional and I can and, like as you get the hang of them it's and I mean the fact amazing. that they had a 20 minute demo yes. is indication that, that that's like tip of the iceberg so yeah. I'm guessing this is a pretty full fledged game yeah, yeah. The, the way they were describing it like there's a very clear like story intent like they're kind of going with the uh, I forget what it's called but the very famous Iron Man storyline dealing with like the ghost of his past or um, Demon in a Bottle Demon in a Bottle thank oh you oh my god we're you going to be drunk Iron Man in VR are Probably. you kidding me I, <laughs> they very much were like there's inspiration from that storyline for sure the villain ghost seemed to be uh, pretty prominent in it a little bit or something someone who looks like ghost um but yeah i loved it way more than i expected to and Mm -hmm. i'm really excited to go back in because it's just it's so fun to be able to like nail that sense of flying of like stopping short or like missing a a drone coming at you because you dashed out of the way super quick it's really cool i would say this and all the other games we demoed very clearly if you don't have psvr extension cables get those because Iron Man lets you do like full 360 moving around. Like you could be facing the opposite way of the camera and still be perfectly fine in the game. And you'll be looking at that direction. Yeah. Like it's so open world ish. There's a lot going under there. If you have these short cables, you're going to tie yourself up and probably break. Or they can make a wireless cable. version. Or that. Yeah. I, there was, so I was at, I was at PAX East and there was Oculus quest stuff everywhere. And watching that get demoed is just surreal. Yeah. And it's also, I think it's like three ninety nine or yeah, something I think it's like that. Like, and just watching people put that, and it's it has it has a storefront in it. It has it has the the you basically it's got a PC in it. You put it on your head, and you're just there's no you don't have to put like weird things in the corners of your living room and create this like digital Roomba zone or whatever. <laughs> like it just works, and I really hope that's where all of this is going. We've seen continued support for PSVR from PlayStation. The only thing that's really missing is like a legitimate hardware revision. Yeah, um, I'm guessing we'll get that with PS5. I how, really how hope so. Because that, I mean, we'll see. That's, what, yeah. that's what is keeping so many people back from totally. getting that because like a lot of people just don't have the space for that kind of like wiring. Yeah. In it's, there. It's also, it's, it's such a hassle. A, it's such a first it world yeah. problem, but yeah. for, I kind of sigh every time I'm like, Oh yeah, I got to pull that like big bag of coils out from <laughs> underneath my entertainment center yeah. and like put that thing on and blah blah blah. And it's it's obviously yeah, it takes a few. It doesn't take a long time. I know you're already writing a comment to me, <laughs> but like I love my PSVR. I would use it more if it was just like one or two seconds quick. It's why like I play my PS4 all the time because it's in suspend mode and I hit a button and I'm in Sekiro. Or yeah. same thing with my Switch. I just grab it, I hit a button, and I'm in. Yeah, this 
You need all, that for this. Absolutely. And all the games that we played, like, so made me confident in the future of PSVR and made me, like, absolutely excited for so many of these experiences. I so wish at the end of the state of play, they had also been like, hey, we just showed you 10 PSVR games. PSVR is back on sale. Right. Go pick it up. That like, take cool. that loss to just get people to buy these games. Totally agree. Because, like, I, the install base is getting larger. They, I think they hit 4.92 million or so, which is pretty great for a VR headset right now in the market. That is surprisingly good. Also, yeah, that, PlayStation's giving us, they gave us a, an excellent Spider-Man game last year, an Iron Man game this year. What are they going to give us next year? I know that, like, this Marvel relationship was, yeah. obviously we have the Avengers project looming in the background from Square, but, yep. like, I love, obviously I want as many people as possible to play Marvel games because mm-hmm. they're so beloved around the world as a franchise, but, like, man, I love that we're getting this game. I also like that it's not the same as the MCU. It's yeah. nice yeah. to yeah. kind of break a few rules and kind of just... Eek out a new and, and hyper focus on one character's world specifically, which is yeah. really cool. You yeah. know, I think like the Avengers thing is great, but that's going to be like it's going to be a mixed bag from no matter how you perceive it, because you'll be jumping from character to character, and sometimes you'll have to play as Hawkeye. <laughs> well, you can go down to the barber or shop Ronan. and get a yeah. sexy new haircut that you saw Pink rocking in a music video. If you want to do that. <laughs> That's true. I'm sorry. How no, much time fine. do I have left? How I, I much more time many, can I shit on Hawkeye? As long as you want to. I read too many posts talk, calling him a daddy this morning. So oh, oh me too. Yeah, there was a lot of that. Uh, anyway, yeah. So there were a lot of really awesome PSVR games coming out. Uh, Iron Man has a just nebulous 2019 launch window. So hopefully we'll find out more about that soon. One more very quick thing. Yeah. I didn't get to play it myself, but the Five Nights at Freddy's demo, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's VR, is the loudest I've ever heard anyone sh- <laughs> like an adult man shriek publicly. I, like there are certain vr experiences i am very big, big into horror like that's, yeah. my, that's my sort of niche i guess and um i find vr horror a step too far me too like, I, 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 I love horror i'm I in the exact same boat cope with it. like i you know alien isolation um resident evil, resident 2, evil yeah uh no sorry uh seven seven, seven um you know like those are just it, it's too much it's too I, much. I find it t- tense enough with headphones yeah. in the dark in this, my house. I, I would, don't need yeah. to be in there. Yeah, like Dead this Space guy itself was, was horrifying. Yeah, this guy was like our age. He was screaming. I mean, Five Nights at Freddy's, I scream regularly yeah. playing it. Because it's cheap. It's yeah. jump scares. It is, yeah. it is cheap. Yeah. But, but it works. Like, it works. Like, it's efficient. Yeah. You can't it's like paranormal pl- activity. You can't look away in VR. Like You can't cover your eyes. You just close them, which feels oddly like counterintuitive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I just don't. Yeah. But yeah, that, you were telling me about that at the event. It's it's crazy the uh, different uh, experiences that were on display. Like yep. before we move, a quick shout out to Concrete Genie, which was also just like the super serene. I just got to like paint in a landscape that was beautiful, and I'd make thistles grow, and then yeah. I'd make shooting stars happen, and it was just so calming and relaxing. And there's also a free paint mode, so for more creative people who can draw, unlike me, there is a lot of mobility in there that you get you're, to just make what you want. You're so right that in like you like a, a ten foot radius, there was like there was like sci-fi from No Man's Sky. There was like this action movie. From from Blood and Truth, there's comedy, and then there's horror, and then there was also golf. Yep, <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's incredible what PSVR is offering, and I'm so excited to cover those games as we go forward. Yep, moving on, going to move on to our memory card segment, uh, and thankfully, thanks to Ronnie, we have a new intro song for it, which I'm going to play for you if I get it right right now. Memory card. Wow. Oh, I like it. That's really good. Is that the same Stoop Orphan who did the, the <laughs> news crunch? Like yeah, he, he was in an accident, and now he uh, <laughs> uh, now he has a robot voice. I think he lost it, too. He's a Marmory car. Was that Psycho Manus? It was. Yeah. I like Psycho. He I don't, that's great. Much. He got one of those, like, <laughs> things in his throat. You were back in the old, like, uh, Newsies days. You were allowed to eat cigarettes if you were a child. So <laughs> that, no, that was great. I like that. like eight hours a day, so yeah. you had to eat something. Uh, Lucy, you're bringing us a story this week. Yeah, so I just wanted to... Um, go down a little, little little trip down memory lane uh, to when I was a teenager um, and all my friends in high school. I was sort of the only one, because I went to an all-girls private school, um, and I was sort of the only one that played, there were maybe a couple of others but uh, who played video games, but my friends were very supportive of that, and so they pulled together, and uh, for my birthday they got me a copy of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, which is amazing, like all these like little private girls' schools in their uniforms, like presenting me with Tony Hawk's. <laughs> Roses skater. are red, violets are blue. Tony Hawk's pro skater. That, that sounds like a dream I had in high school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I grew up to be incredibly gay. So yeah, there you go. Um, it worked out for everyone. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it was it was for me. It was a, a real that that game was a real coming of age game because it 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 sort of forged the center. This is before we could drink. So it kind of forged the center of my social life. 
Um, so I would have people around to my parents' place, um, like boy, you know, m- m- males and females, um, and we would just play this game. It was like we would all gather around and turn up the music really loud on the CRT TV, and like try and beat each other at the at levels. Mm-hmm. And I guess it was just a very formative experience for me because through these. Um, uh, sort of evenings that we would spend together. These are some of the greatest friends I made um, through high school, and like they, these are some friendships that have kind of that I that I still have. And it was thanks to to this game. And it didn't. I mean, I was the one that owned it, so I was also very good at it. And that was an incredible, <laughs> like an incredibly powerful thing to be as a woman as well. Um, I would regularly like beat these guys' asses, and it was so empowering to me. In fact, like one of the very few times I've ever dated a boy was was in was during this period, and like he got really upset when I beat him at the warehouse level. Oh my god! <laughs> um, and we subsequently broke up. Uh, and I like he's to th- been practicing ever since. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I like to think that um, at beyond six hundred, he'll he's going to challenge yeah, that, you. That was, shout out to Will. Uh, I like to think that you know that had something to do with it. But it was again, it was it was so formative, and and we would you know it was pop punk it introduced me to the Dead Kennedys and 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 Primus and hell yeah. So that's know. actually one of the like, my favorite aspects of those games is uh, I'm I'm a like a big hip hop fan, and the amount of sort of independent underground hip pop that people gamers especially were exposed to through those games is huge mm. like i think the 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 take the musical takeaways that people got from those games is like is so goddamn cool yeah it was kind of like it's it i know this sounds really embarrassing to say but it was kind of like for us it was kind of like it was sexy it was like a sexy game like it wasn't like a nerdy game it was like the music was the soundtrack like had so much to do with that. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it had like it had like real music, like they'd did. have on MTV, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean it did, and it was it was skateboarding, and you could play as a woman as well, and it was just it was it was a very formative game for me, and it's interesting because I never really went on to play any of the others, and I didn't really play skate. Um, I think it was really just a moment in time, Not that moment, yeah. um, and. Yeah, it kind of it helped me. It it helped shape me, I think, because mm-hmm. it was when I was just starting to become confident as a human being. I just got my braces taken off. You know, I was like finally embracing my femininity because I was you know, I, I was starting to become like a woman, I guess, and No, I mean it's like it's uh, significantly important to be good at anything at that age. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. That's, and and that's like, pretty hard to even do. Even if it leads to breakups. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. Exactly. And it was just yeah. Most it, of that age is like bumbling horror of like <laughs> being awkward and uh, inefficient. Exactly. And I, I guess you know, I still listen to the soundtrack and it just takes me right back to those so so many evenings spent playing that game and having an incredible time. And I kind of miss that because I haven't really had an experience like that with a video game since. I mean, I've, I've had great multiplayer experiences. I, you know, I got really into Overwatch and, and Apex Legends and stuff. But, it, you know, this is this was this was like a teenage full of hormones, like yep. listening to music really loudly, like going out the back and smoking cigarettes. And it felt kind of like illicit and cool. And I don't think I'll ever experience have that experience with a video game again. But um, yeah, that that's my memory card moment. Thank um, you. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah, Tony Hawk was yeah. It's such a obviously that franchise went not great places, but those early games I think are so formative in a lot of ways for a lot of people. Whether it's the music, whether it's yep. specific moments in time, yeah, like the. Th- Tony Hawk 3 soundtrack for me is like my first exposure to hip hop and a lot of that sort of music and yeah those those games are amazing. I yeah. really wish that like that skating games would make their renaissance. Me too. Just have yeah. a proper comeback because it's sort of like it's one of those things where it's like every I feel like every other sort of like know, like archetypal video game genre has kind of evolved and sh- shifted and changed and become transmuted and we don't have any like you can't even like skateboard in GTA, you know? Like I, I love how they scale to be like fun fuck around games, but also stuff that you can 
expert play. Yeah. I mean, they are so strategically poised to fit perfectly in the modern gaming landscape in terms of like streamers and expert level players, but also just goofy idiots who just want to do funny let's plays. Like they are immediately forgiving. You fall off your board from a 40 foot jar- drop and you go, oh, oh shit. shit, you get up, you get <laughs> yeah. back on, you keep skating. And like there's this, gr- you know, they're playing like Del the Funky Homo Sapien and Dilated Peoples in the background. You're just like skateboarding everywhere. Or you can be insane yeah. and never touch the ground, touch basically. The ground. Or it's you can throw in tricks. all the cheat codes if yeah. you do it well. Yeah. And it's like, I, I, would, you, I would put on the cheat codes and see how long I could skate around a rail, like how long I could grind before the computer would get yeah. mad at me, basically. Yeah, like it, it was so malleable of an experience. And the fact that it went, like they, they, no pun intended, fell off the rails and went into Tony Hawk Ride and Air, and then EA was like, we'll take it from here, guys. And they made skate, and then they stopped, and then... Now they're just really non-existent. Um, I would love to see them come back. And well, there's that new game coming out that was announced at E3 last yeah. year. That everyone Session. thought and was, everyone was like, Session. 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 Yeah. Oh, no, I'm amazed Session. that I can remember it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that could be oh. really cool. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. And maybe EA could just make Skate 4. Yeah. Stop mm-hmm. us all from asking. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, Lucy, thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. We also have a story this week from a listener. Remember, if you want to write in with a story that you would like us to read during Memory Card, write into beyond at IGN.com with the subject line memory card so I know what it's relevant to and we'll be sure to read some of these on the show each week. Uh, Max, would you like to read this one? Yeah, sure. This comes from James S. And he says, hey guys, just wanted to say real quick, I love the show. Thanks, James. Funnily enough, my memory card actually actually involves a memory card. Uh, back in the PlayStation 1 days, I used to grab my memory card when I would go hang out with my friends so we could compare saves and such. My friends and I were, and are, still eh, and still are huge RPG fans, so my memory card was filled with games such as Final Fantasy IX and Lunar Silver Star Story Complete. Well, this one time I went to visit my friend and we were running around in her backyard. For whatever reason, most likely I was a dumb 12-year-old, I was running backwards and flipped right into their inflatable <laughs> pool with my memory card in my pocket. No. Three discs worth of progress on Final Fantasy IX were lost that day with many other saves. I was upset, but it is a fo- it is a fond memory I have now that I can look back on and laugh about. Oh, that's a good one. Oh my that's god, thank, a, you, thank you, James. Thank you for sharing. sharing. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. a great like I, I can picture that very strongly in my mind. Yeah, usually memory cards died themselves yeah, or they said that. mad cats on them and they just blew <laughs> up. Um I don't really hear a lot of stories about backflipping into an inflatable. Pool. I think with all with all of our doom and gloom about a cloud based future, that's one thing you don't really have to worry no. about. That's yeah. true. unless you have your well, no, even then, you don't. You can throw the whole PS4 in the pool. Who cares? Mm-hmm. It'll be fine yeah. in the cloud. I had two really bad memory issues, though, on my Xbox 360, weirdly, on the hard drive. I completely lost I, one on the PS2, one on the 360. My 360 lost my entire Assassin's Creed 1 save Ooh. right before the final assassination. <sighs> uh, What'd and you do? Just like watching I replayed YouTube? the whole game. No. Yeah, I replayed the whole game like an idiot. And, <sighs> yeah. Uh, and then on my PS2, I played through Psychonauts, and I was like 80% of the way through the game. And then it just, I went back to it one day. It was a game, I was renting it from Blockbuster, booted it up one day, just no more save. <sighs> I don't know what happened to the save at all. It just completely went away. It's so devastating. I can, I feel James's pain when mm-hmm. it comes to losing saves. Uh, but thank you again so much for writing in for that. Remember, beyond at IGN.com with the subject line memory card, and we'll read some of those on the show. Uh, moving on before we wrap up. Want to bring back a trophy test? Trophy, yeah. test, these trophy in a while. test. Does it have a theme song yet? No, but Ronnie is working on one. Okay. I think that the theme song should just be you going trophy test, trophy test, just like you did. Yeah, it's just I'll have it, him use and it. And it makes the the trophy noise like eight times. Yeah, yeah. there'll also be like a cigarette eating child in the background. <laughs> Ronnie, <laughs> are you taking way. notes, please? And call. then some laser sounds. Ronnie rules, by the way. How Ronnie many, is like how many cigarettes and how close to the microphone? <laughs> how many cigarettes is he eating? Is he just going into them like it's a pack a whole of pack. Fig Newtons? Yeah, yeah, I mean they're in packs of twenty. Is he so taking the is he taking the the wrapper off? I don't know if he eats them like a like an ice cream bar. Where it's just like a, a bite out of. The, I don't know. A little oh, cabin. <laughs> anyway, this week's trophy test is based on Borderlands One. Given that the Borderlands Three announcement came out, great. I have three huge Borderlands. Exactly. Fans wow. Here. So what yeah. better way to do this? Uh, this I have great. five trophies from Borderlands. Uh, so what I've done is basically I have the description. I'm going to give you two titles. Mm-hmm. I don't have two descriptions because things are busy right now. So tell me which of these titles matches the description, which is the true title of the trophy. Uh, so we'll go down the list one through five. Uh, no winner per week. I'm going to tally things through the rest of the year, and we'll declare a winner at the end of the year. First trophy. The objective is to complete 15 missions in co-op. Is the title, there's no, uh, no, wait, sorry. All right, no, we're going to backtrack on that one because it turns out I copy-pasted the wrong title there. 
Oh. Never mind that one. All there right, are so only four trophies this week. One point. You all get you. one point. All right. Yeah. Yes. God. Nice work, guys. I'm so good it's at It's been this. a week. It was a tough one there, but I'm glad we all agreed. Anyway, moving on to the second trophy in this round. The objective is to race around the ludicrous speedway in record time. Is the title of that trophy Speedy McSpeederton or Fast Times at Pandora High? Which is the real title of that trophy? Uh, Speedy McSpeederton or Fast Times at Pandora High? I'm going to go with Speedy McSpeederton. I'm going to go with Fast Times. <sighs> I'm going to go with the first one. Speedy McSpeederton? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The correct answer is Speedy McSpeederton. I knew it. Sorry, I knew it. No, it was my gut was like, that's the one. And then my brain was like, you're dumb. <laughs> It's often what my brain does, apparently, when I don't write the right titles down for trophies. <laughs> Moving on. Played a co-op game with either an employee of Gearbox or someone who had this trophy. What? So the That's so specific. Yeah. The, the games used to do this in like the early PS3, Xbox 360 days. Yep. Uh, you basically need to play with an employee. Is the title of this trophy, and they'll tell two friends, or is this collusion? Which of those is the true title? And they'll tell two friends, and they'll or tell two friends. is this collusion? Is this collusion? Is this collusion? The correct answer is, and they'll tell two friends. Damn it. Max, congrats. You got nobody, was, nobody was hollering about collusion until 2014. Yeah, that's exactly. what I was thinking, yeah. actually. And just true. as I said it, I was like, damn, that was a 2014 thing. <laughs> All right. The gate had not been opened yet. Uh-huh. Uh, we were still talking Gersman Gate back then. <laughs> yes. Moving on to the next trophy. It is to kill 25 enemies with corrosive weapons. Is the title of this trophy Face Off or Face Melter? Face Melter. Face off. Confidence. Face off. The correct answer, face melter. Okay. Oh, this is stupid. I'm yeah. That's right. It's me, Max, Max Scoville, the number one Borderlands fan at IGN.com. <laughs> Keep it locked, everybody. And the final trophy. This is the platinum trophy of Borderlands 1. Uh, the objective is to, you have defeated all bosses and are a powerful force to be reckoned with. Is the title of this trophy Borderland Defender or Pandora Protector? Borderland Defender or Pandora Protector? I'm going to go with Borderland Defender. Pandora Protector. I'm going to go with Pandora Prote- Protector, even though I think it's wrong. Yeah, the same. I just did my reaction to all of these. But it's like, also, I feel like that's the better one, so I just want to say it. Me too. Thank you. I appreciate that, because the correct answer is Borderland Defender, their trophy name. We got it wrong again? You got it wrong yeah, we got again. got it wrong again. So, Max, you got three points that time. Lucy, you got one. Brian, you did not get any. Though you all get one uh, concession point, because I screwed up that first one. So, congrats. So, I, the only point I got was <clears throat> not real. Was the accident point. Yeah. <laughs> little participation trophy for you there. Oh my god. So congratulations to you all. Uh that trophy test. If you want to write in with a game I should do trophies for, feel free because there are a lot of games and it's hard to always narrow it down. So just write into beyond at IGN.com with that. Uh as we wrap up, what are you guys playing this week? What have you been playing? Sekiro. Sekiro. I suck at it. Blood, I'm I'm blood, getting blood. better at it. <laughs> Uh, I got back from PAX and just turned that game on and hit the ground running uh and just crushed through like three or four bosses and it was so nice. Um, I'm taking my sweet time. I'm grinding a lot, uh, exploring a lot, finding items and stuff like that, backtracking to see if there's anything I missed, like buying all the cool stuff from the vendors. I adore that game. I actually, the more I play it, the more I like it. I, once you like get over a hurdle and like open up an entire new area, it's so, it's like your reward for struggling through some pain in the ass boss is this like just gigantic vista of fun, new, insane things to climb and, and, you know, play on and kill weird men with the sword. It's mm. it's so good. I keep eating shit in that game. Like I'm I'm like I'm at the sort of cleric beast level where I'm just trying to beat the same like preliminary dude. Who are you up to? I don't even want to tell you. Why is it the bull? It's embarrassing. No. Is it Before the, uh, then, the ogre on the steps? No, it's like a mini boss. Uh, it's like I am just struggling with this guy. Juju the Drunko or whatever his name. <laughs> his name. Like he's he's not hard. Like I know he's not hard. It's just that I'm. I get, I get him right down to the very little nub of health, mm-hmm. and then I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna just forget parrying and just like go for the kill. Yeah, and I get over eager, and then he just kills me with one swoop, and I I'm, just, I'm like, actually, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. I'm terrible at parrying in that game, uh, and in all the games, game is all parrying. <laughs> yeah, but you, I've I've found ways to sort of like fake my way through it because I've uh, upgraded all of my like sub items, so I have tons of them. So I just throw those funny flashbangs on the ground, and they're like, oh, and then I beat them up, and I run and I hide, and I, yeah. Just... So you're just cheesing your way through? Hell yeah, I am. I don't care. I do you're not care. You're making it through. You're making it. Yeah, but I'm, I'm like, making it through. I'm like, I no, I like, I need to master the system. Like, I need to like, I can't cheese my way through because or throw smoke bombs. Yeah. <laughs> 
Exactly. Well, maybe I maybe I will. Throw the garbage on the ground and it All scares right. them. Okay. Max, yeah. you're still working through Bloodborne? Yeah, no, I played a little more secure and oh, I was like, okay. I, this is not for me. We talked about this last yes, week. Yeah. Brian, after you you and Zach left, you know, frothing at the mouth about how much you love Sekiro, I was like, we just were like sitting here and we're like, are you gonna play more? I don't think so. No, <laughs> thank you. No, I went back to Bloodborne. I, I've been chipping away at it still. I just got to uh Rom the vacuous spider, who's just a big, big bastard that dude or is where i think that's where a lot of people a walk away it's a woman, um, little, sh- little shitty babies oh, no i'm oh. i've been sort of like i basically got there and died and was like yeah that's gonna i'm gonna and it was like not even in like the the second stage or whatever and i was like i'm gonna go explore some more so I, now I'm, I'm poking around up in the the lecture hall fighting those slime professors or whatever so yeah what, was it rob or rom 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 you know? okay just one robert the robert, robert. Robert. <laughs> they decided like just, for, just for that one boss they were like let's choose robert yeah. Kyle this is chris the hell starved beast <laughs> oh i got um i got cyber bullied by other other hunters of the internet on that like uh, for the first time in my game just a bunch of strangers Ooh. from who i believe are like could be internet friends, but they just came into my game and they kicked my ass yep. and they took my things and I had to go to work and I haven't turned it on since That's then. That's always so. Mm-hmm. like so insulting when that happens. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, oh, fuck you. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. sometimes they toy with you like an old lion <laughs> or they just kind of follow you around and like poke you in the back and you're like, are you a friend or are you here to kill me? And then they notice that you don't fight tell. back. Yeah, and they do that like weird Komodo dragon thing where they, they nip at your leg and follow you for three days until you die of poison. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah, I've been playing a similarly tough game, uh, Stardew Valley. Yeah, it's I don't. Real. Do you want you want to hear a fucking story? Sure. Do you want to hear I, some if, shit? Yeah, I'm sorry to swear. Mind. If no. you're upset by my, my f- uh, ire towards Stardew Valley, turn <laughs> off the podcast right now. Stardew Valley, which I played on the Nintendo Switch because I'm not about to sit on my couch and farm yams or whatever. I played that game, and apparently, I did not get a fucking memo because I didn't know that you could go to the mines to get yeah. ore. I put, I think, 10 hours into that game without realizing oh, no. that you can mine for ore but to make equipment such as farming equipment. I totally understand that because it seems like something that you shouldn't be able to do to go in those mines and like fight the enemies and stuff. It just doesn't seem like in step with the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. That game is such a, like, I'm so glad I'm playing it, not when it first came out, and when there are like tons of just the most filled up wikis of information yep. of how to, I, like... It's I, like Minecraft when it first came out and people were like, oh, I think you can make a shuffle. And now there's like a button in the game that just has a recipe. <laughs> I Yeah, I, I, I had a slight existential crisis playing this game because I, I got that. 10 hours into the stupid farming game and didn't know I didn't I don't know where the cave the mines the caves are I literally have never been there because I immediately quit my game finding out that I was doing it horribly wrong and I realized if I am this bad at a video game about farming what other important memos and steps have I missed in life like what else am I doing horribly wrong that I just didn't get a memo on? Like what am I like? How much am I getting fucked on taxes? How many times have I failed in basic interpersonal communications? What am I doing wrong dietarily? I don't know. Like, am I walking wrong? I sure as shit can't drive a car. So anyway, I don't play Stardew Valley anymore. I hope you enjoy that radish game. I'm not gonna bring up games anymore. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I no, it's, no, I, I love no, it's it. really I, good. I've been playing Stardew for a week. I want that to I be my fun. new ringtone. <laughs> that, <laughs> that just Stardew. Max's rant about Stardew Valley. Um, be sure to write in with how you feel about Stardew Valley to beyond at IGN.com or max at IGN.com. Mm-hmm. Anyway, maybe, if maybe you're playing Stardew Valley, Valley and you haven't been to the mines, you're also bad at that game. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, it, I played that game once two years ago, felt terrible at the game and stopped, and I've come back to it and am enjoying it way more this time, but I can totally understand that feeling. I'm just holding out for Animal Crossing. Yeah. That's, where, that's where the real magic is. Hopefully this year. Get that boy out of that farm. Who gives a shit? I'm going to talk to animal mayors. And, can you and marry the people in Animal Crossing? No, I mean, you can go to their house at 2 o'clock in the morning, bang on their door, <laughs> ask for furniture. I gave uh, I gave <laughs> Abigail an amethyst, and she ate it. Really? Yeah, she was like, thanks. How did you know I was hungry? Re- wow. Yeah, canonically, she just eats amethysts. <sighs> Man. But will also fall in love with me. There was this dude, there was a lion named Aziz in my game. I used to dig potholes in his front yard and <laughs> beat him with a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Video games are great. Can't anyway, wait. thank you so much for listening to Beyond. This has been episode 585. Remember, be sure whatever platform you're listening to us on, whether it's iTunes, Pandora, Spotify, Google, whatever, please be sure to rate, subscribe, uh, leave a review if you can. We always appreciate it. Uh, and again, you can write in with questions or with memory card segment uh, stories that you may have at beyond at IGN.com. Uh, we are on Twitter. You can find us there. I'm at JM Dornbush. Max, where are you? Max Scoville on all the things. Brian. Agent Bizzle. And Lucy. Uh, Luce O'Brien. 
And that has been Beyond Episode 585. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, Beyond. 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 Beyond.